Let's get our hymns and turn to number 746. We're going to do all five verses. Every song has a message. He keeps me singing. Amen.
presence this morning for everyone that has turned aside to come to worship you, Father. We just ask that you bless this offering and bless each one of our that gives. And may our church be a good steward of what Lord, that people have given to this church and use it in the way to proclaim your gospel not only here in this community but around the world. Lord, just be Brother Chad, as he comes with your message, Lord, if there be one in our midst that needs to make a decision for you, Father, whatever it may be, we just pray this this may be the opportunity in time. We love you because you first loved us and you gave your only begotten Son. And we just give praise and glory in this precious name. Amen. Amen.
sorry. <laughs> that made that sound mean. You don't want to appear now. Trust the number two. Okay. Y'all pray for us. This is the first time we've done this. Other than a couple of practices. Only two last practices. I don't even remember how it goes. <laughs> we'll pretend. I'm kidding. <laughs> and I should have, but for them that don't know, we're having a baptismal service this morning. Uh, my little girl, I have to be more specific when I say that. <laughs> my youngest little girl, Eslyn, um, has been asking for a long time. I mean, for at least six weeks. Maybe longer, I don't know. No, it's been okay, a I, year. That's why she comes, just to set me straight. <laughs> um, Amen. Because of my 
daughter's youth, I've been reluctant, and I apologize for that, but because everybody matures at a different age, some people get saved when they're really young, some get saved in their teens, some don't get saved when they're 70 or 80 or 90, but that little girl's been asking how she could come to know the Lord now for a while, and uh, watching Cameron get saved and then get baptized, she just kept asking me, when, when can I, when can I? So last Sunday after church, Sunday evening after church, I believe, no, I apologize, Sunday morning after church, um, she followed me into my office because I was studying for Sunday night. And uh, she got on her little knees in my office floor and prayed and asked Jesus to save her. And I promised her we'd baptize her today. Now, if you're able to stay for that, I'd love for you to. If it, time gets away from you, you have to go, we understand. But uh, I'm asking if you're able to stay and support her decision and celebrate with us her decision to serve Jesus and to invite Him into her life and heart. So anyway, we'll be doing that here in just a little bit. <clears throat> And I didn't announce it. I'm going to ask you this morning, please, to turn to Acts chapter 8. Woo! Amen. Some of you think you know where I'm going with that, and you don't. So, but As you're turning to Acts chapter 8, let me share something real quickly with you while I turn this mic off. Uh, because I forgot. I'm giving you time to turn there, but I'm also telling a story. There was a guy recently who was visiting here. And he's one of these people, he's uh, one of his, I guess it's his profession is preparedness. Being prepared. Making sure you know what to do in a crisis. And he said, Chad, do you have a plan in place for if somebody comes kicking through that door? And I said, well, I, I don't know if I'd call it a plan, but there's half this congregation's armed and I have a pistol under this pulpit, believe it or not. I probably shouldn't tell you all that. There's one in there. I'm pro Second Amendment, in case y'all didn't know. Anyhow, but there's several people in here on. Don't look for them. They're here, okay? But that's not necessarily a plan because we haven't practiced actually doing it. And it's a whole lot different to do than it is to talk about. Amen, right there. So they asked me, do you have a plan? And I said, no. And they said, well, you need to have a drill or something. So I had this great idea. I was going to come jump through that door and scare everybody and, and, and get everybody ready for what's getting ready to happen. And, and uh, then it dawned on me. That's a good way Chad gets shot. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> In fact, if we have a drill, I'll tell you about it. And I hope everybody gets the memo because I don't want to get shot. But this idea was thrown out there. and I'm going to throw it at you. And I'm giving you time to turn to Acts chapter 8. Uh, I'm, this, this is just an idea, but I think it would work, okay? If you're in here and you're not armed, and somebody ever kicks, we've got it locked, but if they ever bust through that door and try to start hurting people, take that big blue hymnal, <laughs> everybody, I promise you, 50 people take that and chuck it at that door, it's going to take them a minute to recover before they can start shooting, and we'll get them, wait, we'll, we'll save a lot of lives using that hymnal right there. And some of these bibles are heavy enough to do some damage. That's a sword. Hey, that's a sword. Amen. Right. Look, my face ain't God anyway, but I didn't think it was a bad idea. I said I'd share it with you. I'll share it with you. So some of y'all will duck and run under the pew. The rest of us will throw a book. And some of us will pull a better pistol. But at the end of the day, God will take care of us. We'll be all right. <clears throat> now, I've given you time to find Acts chapter 8. If you would, please direct your attention to verse 18. Acts chapter 8 in verse 18, and the Bible says, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity and much prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you first of all just for being my God and allowing me to be one of your children. Lord, I thank you that you saved me. I thank you that you gave me good godly people to teach me. I thank you, Lord, so much for all you've done. But now I have to ask you, Lord, please, please help me preach your word. Lord, because I'm a man, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And because I'm a man, sometimes my opinions fly into places that don't belong. 
So, Lord, I'm asking you now to give me clarity of thought. Allow me, Lord, now to preach your word and only your word in a way that's well-pleasing to you and helpful to us. And, Lord, help me to listen as well and to receive of your message what you'd have me to use and learn and apply to my own life as well. Father, I pray now that you just give us a open heart and mind to hear your word and to apply it to our lives. And again, I ask you for your power. Lord, I can't do this without you. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you were here last week, you'll remember that I was in the book of Joshua. And we talked about three stories that represent who your enemy is. We talked about the Jericho story and the picture of the world. We talked about the AI story and the picture of the flesh. And then we talked about the Gibeonites and the picture of uh, Satan himself. Well... <clears throat> That was actually a two-part message, and if I had continued, y'all would have run me out of here because there was a whole other part to that. So today, the title of this message is, Who is Your Enemy? Part 2. <coughs> Who is Your Enemy? Part 2. And we're going to look at several, but these are actually sub-points to the main three. <coughs> so first, I want to show you what outside zealots can and will do to the church. Back up, please, to chapter 7, just a few verses. Let's look at this. Acts chapter 7 verse 51 this is Stephen y'all remember Stephen? Stephen was a good man a godly man filled with the Holy Spirit and he was standing for Jesus at his own peril now I praise God we've not come to that yet in this life in this country in some countries maybe but here in the United States it's not quite that bad yet but in Stephen's day standing up and telling the truth it can get you killed. And it did. It got him killed. Acts chapter 7 verse 51 says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. And you wonder why they're mad at it. <clears throat> you stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did so to you. Which of the prophets have you have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. He's saying not only did they kill all the prophets that talked about Jesus, they killed Jesus too. That's the people you represent. That's what you do. Remember, he's talking to the religious crowd. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones that think they know all about God. But they didn't. He says... Uh, he called in the latter part of verse 52, 52, he told them that they had become betrayers and murderers. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now people get mad at me sometimes because they think I'm being mean or I'm attacking you. I'm not. But I don't love you if I don't tell you the truth. And sometimes the truth is hard to hear. My little girl, Dale, and I, I'm not trying to embarrass her. Again, when I mention a little girl, I've got to be specific. My little girl, Dalen, one day looked at me and said, Daddy, why are you so fat? <laughs> you smell like peanuts? <laughs> now, I'll have you know, I've lost 20 pounds since you said that. Look at that, Jack. Look at that. Look at that. I'm still not where I want to be, but I've lost 20 pounds. But sometimes people will tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. Now, was she being mean? Does she love me? Yes. Sure she does. So if I say something you don't like in here, feel free to catch me and ask me if I meant it personally or not. I'm telling you up front, I never intend to hurt anybody. And if I've ever hurt you, and listen, sooner or later I'm going to upset somebody. Y'all know that, right? It's just the law of averages. There's a bunch of y'all and one of me sooner or later, I'm going to let what my daddy called my alligator mouth overload my hummingbird behind and I'm going to say something that's going to upset somebody. I apologize in advance for that. I'm human. But most of the time, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. And this is what Stephen was doing here. Yeah. Stephen was standing up for Jesus and he was telling them what they had done. You killed the Savior, you idiots. He didn't say that, but that's what he's implying. You killed the guy the prophets were telling us was coming. He said, which of the prophets have you not persecuted? Now you're betrayers and murderers. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels that have not kept it. He said, you got the law. You broke your own law. They killed an innocent man. That's murder, ain't it? By the way, abortion is murder. Amen. Like it or not. And it ought to be against the law. And it ain't. There's something wrong with a 
world that'll kill a bunch of babies and then make it like there ain't nothing wrong with it. God help us as a nation. I don't blame any of you for that, but it's sad. But he said, you have the law and you've not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Well, sure they were. And they ought to be. The Bible says they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, I don't even want to visualize that. I don't. I can't imagine it. Running up on somebody and gnashing them with your teeth. But that's what they did. They didn't want to hear what he had to say, so they wanted to shut him up. You know, that's still going on today. If somebody don't want to hear what you have to say, they resort to violence. Why? Ain't you as entitled to your opinion as I am to mine? Yeah. <laughs> I would have thought so. Look, if you don't like what I have to say, more power to you. I'm not mad at you. I love you. But there's some don't love. They just get mean. And these Jews did that. They got mean. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But that ain't the end of it. Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. You know what's neat about that? I don't have time to get into it deep. But the Bible tells us that Jesus sat down on the right hand of God. You notice here He's standing. I believe He got up to look down on His servant Stephen who was standing up for Him. Hey, when you stand up for Jesus, He'll stand up for you. Ooh, that's good right there. When you stand up for Jesus, He'll stand up for you. I know that. Because when Stephen stood up for Jesus, Jesus stood up for Stephen. It gets better. He said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears. I think of three-year-olds every time I read that. <laughs> every time I read that, I like, you know, if you've never had more than one kid, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but if you've got more than one, they'll do that. They'll say something, and then they don't want to hear what the other one says back. That's how they win an argument. You know, those adults doing that? They'll say what they want to say, but if you try to say what you want to say, oh, they shut up their ears, and some of them are fine. And I don't care what your particular opinion is, that's wrong. That and you're right. You ought not resort to violence for any reason. <clears throat> they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. He saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And, uh, and he told them about it. Verse 56 he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man. Standing on the right hand of God, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped up their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. That means they threw rocks at him until he died. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul was a Pharisee. Saul was there with them. Saul was a religious zealot. And that's enemy number one. Sometimes your enemy are these religious zealots. These people who claim to love God, claim to know God, but their heart is far from Him. I got introduced to a guy this week that I didn't know who he was. Some of you may not know who he is. Please don't go Google him. You don't need to know who he is. He's not worth talking about. But I have been living under a rock, apparently, because this guy's been around for 30, 40 years. I didn't know he was out there. Never noticed. As soon as I tell you this, some of you are going to be like, I remember that guy. I saw him on the news. I had never heard of him. Isn't that wild? A guy named Fred Phelps died in 2014. He used to go to soldiers' funerals and shout and scream and uh, protest because of homosexuality in the military. Now this guy's pastor of a Baptist church. Hey, that church wasn't no more Baptist than the man. And that pastor was far from God. I can say that. Because there was no love in that man's heart. And what grieved me was they put him on MSNBC and interviewed him. And then they made that out to be the example of Baptists. Let me tell you something. Somebody who don't have any love in their heart, don't know God. Because the Bible says in 1 John 4 that God is love. That guy had no love at all. Sometimes you see religious zealots who are our enemies. They call themselves a Christian. They run around with Christian names, but they're not a Christian. 
And let me just tell you this so you understand what I'm saying. Not everybody who tells you they know Jesus knows Jesus. Not everybody who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. There's a man in this community. I'm not going to name him because most of you know him. There's a man in this community who lives right here in this community who told me out of his own mouth. I'm not talking about him. This is what he said to me. This wasn't here to say. It's what he said to my face. He said, Chad, I'm a Christian, but I identify as a Christian because I don't fit anywhere else. He said, I'm not an atheist. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not an Islamist. He said, but I don't believe the Bible. It's just a book of stories. Now immediately, in my own heart, I knew he didn't know Jesus. Because you cannot know Jesus and not believe his word. You can tell me you're a Christian until you're blue in the face. And he admitted to me, he said, I just I call myself a Christian because I don't fit in any other group. That ain't got nothing to do with how you become a Christian. You don't get to just wake up one day and say, well, I guess I fit pegged over here with these guys. Is that how we come to know Christ? No. To be a Christian, you had to have had some moment in your life where you had a conversation with the Savior and you began a relationship with Him. At some point, you had to pray and ask Him to save you. Whatever words you use between you and Him, just so long as you admit it, you're a sinner, and you ask Him for His saving grace, in whatever way you worded it, if you've never done that, you ain't saved. And if you are, it was good enough. All you had to do was mean it. All that little girl over there did, that we're going to baptize her for in a little while, and the baptistry don't save her, but all she did and did right was she called out to her Lord and her Savior, and she said, I want to know you, Lord. I want you to save me. Amen. That's all it took. That's all it takes. If you've done that, you've got it. If you haven't, you don't. It's really that simple. Well, these religious zealots had never accepted Christ. In fact, they killed Him. So that's your first enemy that we're going to look at this morning. Number two is head knowledge believers. Look at these folks. We're in Acts chapter 8. Actually, I want to read a little further. We were uh, we left off in... Uh, Acts 7, 58. I'm going to read the rest of that chapter. It says, They stoned him, and witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, this is, He was calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I want you to know a couple things about verse 60. Number one, a true Christian, somebody who really loves the Lord, doesn't want to pay you back. They're not mad and vengeful. They're throwing rocks at him. And nowhere in here does it say he wished he picked up a rock and chunked it back. It says he prayed for them as they're killing him. As they're throwing rocks at him, he prayed. He knelt down and prayed. He said, Lord, don't hold this sin to their charge. In other words, he said this. They don't know no better. Lord, they just don't know no better. Give them a break. Don't hold it against them. That's the way a Christian looks at it. Some of us may not always act like that. But another thing I want you to notice about this. The Bible says when he said that, he fell asleep. Now, I love the way that's worded because I believe it happened just that way. I think when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he makes it as easy a transition as possible. Now, I was holding my mama's hand when she died. I was holding her hand. And I was looking at her. I was watching that woman take her last breath. And I would that we could all go to be with Jesus as easily as she did. Now, I'm not telling you she didn't hurt. I'm not telling you she didn't have pain. But I believe the Lord Himself put His hand on her and transitioned her over. And I think He took some of the pain away. I think He gave her peace and comfort because when she quit breathing, she wasn't screaming out and hollering. She was breathing one second and then she wasn't. I don't, I look, I know some people don't go over like that. But some do. And Stephen did. The throwing rocks at him, and the Lord let him just go to sleep. I don't think he felt anymore. I think the Lord just let him come on up. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, something to know about this. That enemy I talked about, these religious zealots, are they really hurting the church? 
When we're persecuted by outside entities, what usually happens is we get scattered, but we take the word with us. That's what happened here. Let me put it like this. If they came in here and they threatened all of us and ran us all out of here and said, y'all can't meet in here no more. Well, wherever we go from here, we take the Word of God with us. We're, we're spreading it. You're not stopping the thing. You're spreading it. Right? So, I'm not saying they're not our enemy, but they're not our worst enemy. Because I'm having a conflict with this. Uh, Can we talk about it at church? No. Uh, we need to get the guns out of here then if we're going to... Live, can we, as you were saying. Can we talk about the separate church? Please. Well, I mean, no I, message. A, I understand your conflict. You know, but you just said earlier that we should bring this up and go ahead and say something like this. I'm just saying, if you think about what you just said, isn't there a conflict there? Because I'm having a conflict with that. I understand your conflict. I really do. I can't discuss it right in this moment. I can't. I've got a message. Well, I think that's the proper place to discuss it. I, think it's, I don't have a problem taking all the guns out of here. My face in Christ. But at the same time, oh, okay. there's a reason for the guns, and I'm not going to discuss right. that. Okay. Well, I just wanted you to know to be aware of that conflict. I am, conflict there. I am aware of it. Let me, let me put it like this. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. You can say the same thing about insurance companies. You can say the same thing about insurance companies. You can say, we all ought to get rid of our insurance company and put our faith in the dog. Now, here's the conflict, and I'm going to make it as clear as I know how. What's your faith in? If your faith's in that insurance company, you need to get rid of it. If your faith's in that gun, you need to get rid of it. We have it, but I don't, I'm not really trusting that gun. I'm trusting I'll never need that gun. I didn't buy it. If I really, really was worried about it, I'd be worried. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Personally, I'm all for having a gun. Okay, well, let's let's but not talk about this now, please. Physical. I would appreciate it if you'd just show a little reverence. Then it's a no, pulpit. Sir? Okay. okay, never mind. I never said I wouldn't listen to you, you brother. This ain't the time for it. This ain't, there's a time and a place for all things. This ain't the time for that. It isn't, it isn't. Well, we were talking about how far it was We weren't talking about guns. Yes, we were. Yeah, earlier you were talking about guns. Well, nobody pulled a weapon in this story. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But anyway, let's just obviously you know, we'll discuss it. We'll discuss it afterwards. I'm happy to talk to you, Bob. This ain't the time. If I do that, we'll never get out of here. Nobody will get what God wants him to hear. I'm not here to share with you my opinion. I'm talking about what the Bible says. My opinion we talk about later. What I said about guns was before the message started. My opinion it's on guns is before the message. But it's tied together. Well, that's why I'm afraid and ask God to help me. Because I'm you know, I told you sooner or later I offend some days. Well no, you haven't offended me. it's a it's a matter of just discussion. It's not a And all I'm asking is that we I'm have the discussion, not now. Whatsoever. Let's carry on with the message, please. I'm not so offended. Really. I've been preaching for nearly seven years. I've never had anybody ask me to stop in the middle of a message to have a conversation. I'd appreciate it if this well, didn't happen to be the first time that ever. Maybe that's neither here nor there. Okay. Our number one enemy, the first one we looked at, not our number one enemy, our first one we looked at is outside zone. When we left off here, we're talking about Saul, and he was persecuting the church. And what I want you to understand is when people try to persecute the church, all they do is spread it. That's all they do. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 that this great persecution against the church at Jerusalem is scattered on the broad. Watch what happens with this scattering. Verse 2, And the devout man carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. The Bible says, verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Now we don't have time to talk about Paul this morning. He's in chapter 9. But I want you to understand there's a reason why he quit being called by his Hebrew name Saul, begins to be called by his, uh, his, his Roman name Paul later. And when the Lord changes Paul, the Lord changes Paul entirely. But in this moment, in verse 3 here, he's making havoc of the church. He's entering into every house and hauling men and women and committing them to prison. He's dragging them out of there. He's carrying them off to prison. Verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So again, that's an enemy, but it's not our number one enemy because when, and, and look, it's going to happen someday. They're going to persecute us for our faith someday. The Bible says it's coming. I hope it doesn't come in my lifetime, but then again, I never thought I'd see homosexual marriage in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's an abomination to God, like it or not. So I just didn't think I'd see that in my lifetime. I, it's one thing to do that. I mean, people are free. They can do what they want to do. 
But to call it marriage is an abomination and a stink in God's nose. It is not marriage. Not by the Bible definition. And God designed it. So therefore they were scattered abroad whenever we're preaching the word. So in trying to shut down the church, they spread the church. And so we look here at some others I want you to see. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. That is so interesting to me. And I wish I had more time. But Samaria was full of Samaritans. And Samaritans were not somebody the Jews got along with. The Jews didn't like them. They didn't like the Jews. So it's interesting to me that Philip was willing to go and preach to what is, for all intents and purposes, his enemy. Because we're supposed to tell everybody about the Lord, no matter who they are. Verse 6, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now what's neat about this is when he gets there and starts telling them about Jesus, they listen to him. They're hearing him. Because he's doing things that nobody else has ever done. And, and for one thing, God's given him the ability to do miracles, and he did them. But this is pretty neat. Watch verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, that's paralysis, and they that were lame and were healed. So, in other words, they're watching these evil spirits, these unclean spirits be cast out. They're seeing um, people get... Uh, healed with different uh, sicknesses and diseases, and they're hearing the Word of God. And that was why God gave that power, so it would uh, strengthen the Gospel. Verse 8, And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Here's what's happening. When Philip gets to Samaria, he finds out there's been a guy that's already been there. This guy's name is Simon. He's been running around convincing everybody that he's somebody special. And he's got some power, apparently, to do certain types of magic. Now, I believe with all my ransom soul, he had the power of the devil. The devil has a limited amount of power, but it does have some. And so people who have... Uh, demons in them or people who worship the devil, they, they have some power we don't have. That's a real thing, whether you want to admit it or not. In fact, there's a whole lot of psychological cases that get blamed on, on uh, different, you can call it all sorts of things, and what it really is is a demon. <coughs> and the only way to protect yourself from a demon is to have Jesus Christ in your heart. The Bible says, a house divided will not stand. If you have Jesus in your heart, the devil can't get in. One of the reasons it's so important you get saved, and saved at a young age because that's protection from demonic activity. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, there's nothing stopping a demonic force from coming in, taking over, and doing what he wants to do in you and through. We have no protection from that except Christ. So when he gets there, he finds these people have been bewitched already. They think Simon is some kind of great sorcerer magician. Well, actually, they think he's got the power of God. Well, he's got the power of a God, but it ain't of God. And that's their confusion. Now watch this. They listened to him, but now they're listening to Philip. And by the way, they knew the difference. When they saw Philip, they turned away from these other things to turn to Philip. Not only them, but Simon as well. Verse 11 says, And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. So they had all this regard for Simon. But verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Well, that begs the question. Did they get saved? You know how many people have come to me and said, when I ask them if they have ever been saved, and I ask people that all the time, have you been saved? Almost everybody will tell me, well, I've been baptized. Because the vast majority of people today don't know the difference. Did you know baptism has absolutely nothing to do with salvation? The thief hanging on the cross got saved. The Lord told him he'd be in paradise. That day, he never got in the baptistry. I believe in being baptized, and we baptize here. But baptism doesn't save you. The Bible tells us a bunch of people here that came and, and they believed and, and, and they got baptized. Well, that word belief, you have to be careful with. Because the devil believes in Jesus. Is the devil saved? There's a difference between believing in and believing on. And I've explained that before. I'm not going to get into it deep right this minute. But the reason I know some of these weren't really saved is because even Simon was one of them. Watch, uh, watch this. 
Bible says here in uh, verse 12, says they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. And they were baptized, both men and women. And then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. You know what that tells me? The power of God is so much more powerful than the power of Satan. Because you have a sorcerer doing all these things, then Philip comes to town. And Philip gets everybody that was following Simon to follow him. And then Simon follows him. And they become pretty good friends. The Bible says Simon follows Philip around. He's eating with him and walking with him and talking to him. And Philip even baptized him. You know why? Because if you tell me you believe in Jesus, I can't see your heart. I can't tell if you do or not. If you profess a faith in Jesus Christ, I have to take you at your word. I've got no way to know. The Bible doesn't give me x-ray vision and I can't see the heart, but God can. So when these people get baptized, you would think they're saved, but apparently some of them were not. See, there's a whole lot of people out there with a head knowledge of God, but they've never let it sink from the head to the heart. It's never become a heart thing. And there is a vast difference between what you know and what you really know. One of the biggest ways to know if you truly know Jesus is when you sin against God, it'll hurt you. I'll give you a small example of this. When I knew my daddy was upset at me, I loved my daddy. He was not the godliest man. He was not always nicest guy to get along with, but I loved him and I respected him. And when I upset him and I saw that look of disappointment in his eyes, it hurt me. I hated to disappoint that man. It bothered me because I was his child and I wanted to make him proud. If you belong to Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship, not a religion, but a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're walking with Him and you know Him, it will hurt you to sin against Him. You will know you belong to Him because it hurts when you sin against Him. If you can live your life any way you want to and it don't bother you to sin, I check right with your salvation. Make sure you've got one. So you've got these who get baptized and some of them may have been saved. I mean, we, don't, we just don't know. But here's what we do know. Watch this. The Bible says... Simon himself believed, verse 13, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now a couple things about this I need to clear up. When you get saved, you immediately receive the Holy Spirit, as long as you meant it. When my daughter got saved last Sunday, she immediately received the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us that. There's only a couple of exceptions to that, and this is one of them. First of all, they may not have believed. I don't blame Philip. I think he's preaching it right. But they were so confused by Simon, they didn't really know what to believe. That's number one. Number two, the other reason for the hindering here of the Holy Spirit was because Peter and John needed to witness this. It was for their own good. Because earlier, and I don't have time to turn there, earlier when they were walking with Jesus, they got mad at the Samaritans and wanted to pray fire down on top of them. So they needed to witness Samaritans coming to the Lord. So God waited till they got there to give them the Holy Spirit. This isn't done, but one other place I find anywhere in Scripture. But in this instance, there was a delay. And partly because I believe they had not truly trusted Christ yet. They didn't fully understand. This is why I waited with us. I want to make sure she fully understood what she's doing. Do you know how many people have repeated a prayer because somebody told them to and had no idea why they were doing it? You know how many times that these uh, some of these zealots will go out there and they, they want to pad their numbers so they'll just tell everybody the sinner's prayer and they get them in a big group and say repeat after me and they all repeat okay now you're saved and those kids go around thinking they're saved and nothing ever changed them. There was never anything sincere in their heart. There has to be. There has to be a personal moment between you and Jesus Christ to ever receive or have salvation. So Peter and John come down. The Bible says in verse 15, when they got there, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost because as of yet, verse 16, Holy Ghost had fallen on none of them. They were only baptized in the name of Jesus. They were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. They'd only gotten wet. Verse 17, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. 
And when Simon saw it, through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something you need to hear. There are a lot of charlatans out there, a lot of them, that are in this thing for money. There's a lot of them. Simon was one of them. I wish to God and I pray to God Benny Hinn would get saved. I really do. He's doing more harm to Christianity than he's helping. And there's a bunch of them out there just like him. I'm not going to go through the trouble of naming them. If you can't tell the difference, you need some discernment. But I'll tell you this much. They are doing more harm to Christianity than the outside zealots. Because they're in close and people trust them. People think they know Jesus. And they follow them and they get taken off course. People want to know why we can't all just get in one big Christian circle and hold hands and say, well, we're all the same. we all believe the same. We can't. I wish we could, but we can't because we don't all believe the same. Some of us believe every word of that book and some of us pervert it for our own purpose. Simon didn't know Jesus. He just wanted to have a power that he could charge people for. He wanted to be able to go around and say, I'm going to lay hands on this person, give them the Holy Spirit, and then I'm going to get some money for it. His heart was nowhere near Jesus. And the Bible tells you that. It says, when Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, verse 18. And he said, saying, Give me also this power, that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. You know what that means? He wasn't saved. Oh, but he was baptized? Don't mean anything. He was on the church roll. He went to church all his life. I'm going to tell you, there's some people who go to church their whole lives and never knew Jesus. Never knew him. In fact, there'll come a day when Jesus is going to stand there. He's going to say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. And they're going to say, But Lord, we, we, we were faithful to you. We did all of these things for you. He's going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. The ones that know Jesus, that Jesus knows, He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. That's what the Bible tells us. So these uh, head knowledge believers and then inside zealots are our biggest problem because they're the ones that are doing more damage to the name of Jesus, the ones who claim to really know Him. Peter tries to help him. Verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray if if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. I want you to know that I have no idea if Simon ever got saved. The Bible don't say. The next verse tells us that he asks for prayer, but that don't tell us he got saved. You know, I have people all the time say, well, pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. And I don't mind that. I'll pray for you. But sometimes you need to pray for you. And especially where salvation is concerned. That has to be between you and the Lord. And I wish the Bible would tell us here, but it doesn't. It doesn't tell us if he ever truly surrenders to God. It just says, then answered Simon, verse 24, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things that you have spoken come upon me. He said, pray for me. Pray these things don't happen to you. We don't know if he ever got saved. So, who's your enemy? I told you last week, your main three enemies are the world, the flesh, and Satan. But under that, you got outside zealots that want to persecute the church. You got some so-called believers who don't really believe, and then you got some insider believers who don't really believe, who are doing things for all the wrong reasons. And the only way you're ever going to find any comfort in any of this is you have to know him for yourself. You can't go by what somebody tells you. Not even me. I would never intentionally or knowingly lie to anybody here, but I am telling you. I'm a man, I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I make mistakes. You need to have your own relationship with Jesus Christ. It's got to be personal with you. And the beautiful thing about that, you can start right here today, but you can do that every day from now on. You can have a personal relationship. You can leave that off of the baptism. So I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Question number one. 
Do you know Jesus? I mean, really, you really know Him. You have a relationship with Him. Is He in your heart? Can you remember a time in your life when you called out to Him and asked Him to save you? If that's you, say amen. 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 I got a full part. Amen. Me too. Praise God. If there's somebody here, and listen, I know it's embarrassing. I know it's hard. I know some people don't want to step out. But I'll tell you, there's no better place. If you go to your job or down to the restaurant or somewhere else, you're not going to find the support there you'll find here. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, please don't hold that anymore. Come to this altar. Come to me. Come pray. Pray where you are. I don't care. Call out to Jesus. Ask Him to save you. I promise you. I promise you. If you mean it in your heart, He will. And that's really all there is to salvation. Is that. If you want to know Him, you can know Him. If you don't want to, you don't have to. That's between you and God. But I'm going to pray now and ask the Holy Spirit to move, and I'm going to ask you, if the Lord's speaking to you, to do what God's calling you to do. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you now, please, please move across this room. Please let your Holy Spirit convict you. Lord, there's some in here that are saved, but they need to change things in their lives. Lord, I ask you to show them what and help them do it. Give them strength, power, and peace to follow you. Father, there's some of us sitting here maybe who have never made that decision. Pray, Lord, you give them the courage and the wherewithal to come forward. And Lord, for the rest of us, I just pray you'd help us as we live in this old world to try to be better examples of you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation. I want to give you an opportunity to come to it. We're going to sing page 483. Page 483. If you need to pray or do business with God, you just come forward. You don't have to talk to me. Just come pray. Page 4 8 here.
tempted and tried where often wonder why it should be another solitary while there are others
and the Holy Ghost, buried with Him in the likeness of His death, and raised you all the way. People said, Amen. Amen. All right, we'll have another song or two, and then when we get changed, I'd like for us all to extend uh, a hand of fellowship to our newest uh, convert and member, and then we'll have a prayer and be dismissed.
While we're waiting on it, as well, let me say one more thing. Uh, and I hadn't planned to say this, but I'm going to. In fairness to Brother Bob uh, Brothers, um, I'm going to stay and discuss the conflict that he sees. If anybody else is curious about that conflict, has any interest in it at all, please stay and be a part of the discussion. If you're not interested, you're not interested. But I want to give him an opportunity to share what he had to say, and then I want to, I want to discuss it with him. And so we're going to stay and do that. Because things like that need to be addressed, and the Bible tells us to. Anyway, um, I was taking that girl's Woman. Girl. 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 I feel like Sam. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more time. Praise these things in your name. Yes. Amen. 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 